May 6, 2019, allegedly, according to that thing we call a calendar. And this, indeed, is the Ocelli Effect, broadcast live from the facilities of Ocelli.com. At least that's where we originate from. But you might be listening to this further on down the stream via your fondle slab of choice, your applicable application, etc. And no matter where it is you're coming to us from, welcome. So it is a moon day or a Monday, and I am continuing the series with the one and only Jordan Maxwell. Now, the one and only Jordan Maxwell, guess where you can find him online? Only at one website, because there's only one that's his, jordanmaxwellshow.com. you got to put all those words together, by the way. jordanmaxwellshow.com. You go there, you went to the right place. You can contact Jordan, you can join the Research Society, you can, well, go through the public area if you like. Uh, you can make a donation toward Jordan's well-being, because paying the you know, paying the bills is not something that is easily done when you're telling the truth, and it's always good to contribute to those who have contributed to you. So anyway, there it is, jordanmaxwellshow.com. I'm sure I'll mention it again before this particular episode is done. Now, we have gone through, what, 23, I think. This is the 24th episode, and last week we didn't do it. Why didn't we do it last week? It was my fault. Uh... <laughs> I, I was quite overwhelmed. There was no way that I was going to be able to do the broadcast last week. And I had to contact Jordan and tell him, yeah, I'm not going to make it. Uh, and he was ready to go. Uh, I wasn't. Sorry. But I am here this week. Jordan is here this week. And let's find out how he's doing. Jordan, how are you doing tonight? I think okay. I, I hope I hope I'm doing good. Uh, I, I feel all right, I think. And so we'll see. Right. Hey, look, you know what we're going to do is we're going to answer some questions to get the uh, conversation rolling. And you guys can add in, if you're listening live anyway, you can add in uh, through the chat room or I have my Twitter account open as well. I put a uh, thing on there saying that if you want to ask a question, go ahead and tweet it at me. So there are two readily available places that you can participate in the show live. We could take phone calls. Um, I'm going to leave the phone calls off for tonight because okay. I actually want to have a little conversation with you unless listener questions pile up too high and we can't get to it because I have something. Actually, I'm going to start off with it, and I see I have a question already in the live chat room, and we have two in the email bag waiting. But uh, you can email me after the show if you like at info at ocelli.com. I will save them for the next show I do with Jordan. Or you can, hey, email them to Jordan if you like and you want it answered on this show. He'll be happy to hold on to it and answer it during the show as well. Um, so, you know, like I said before, if you go to his website, which is jordanmaxwellshow.com, there is a contact spot there, and you can send him those questions, too. Always good to know that people are listening and interacting. So before I go into everybody else's questions, Jordan, I have a general observation, and it was bothering me because of something I was writing uh, over the weekend, actually. And uh, what, what it is, I was writing about, uh, well, a piece of my biography, let's just say. <laughs> and I was considering the impact that uh, that our parents have on us. And, you know, the thing is that when you're a young child, you, you, your, your parents are basically God. I mean, for lack of a better term, they really are. They provide everything to you. They reveal the world to you as much as they wish to. They actually instruct you and they build a lot of, you know, great things into a lot of great people when they're great people. Uh, they build uh, some better and worse things into most of us. And usually it's a mixed result no matter who the parent is, no matter who the child is. You know, we all do our best to raise our children and we've all been usually raised by somebody who put in some effort. Um but what's interesting here is a lot of the stuff that is passed on in a religious sense, um, not even necessarily the, you know, listen, you got to go to this church and you got to worship uh, this way and you got to read this book or you got to go to this temple or you got to go to this uh, mosque or you got to not even necessarily that, but just the general sort of ideas 
that get transferred, right? The, 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 the concept of hell and a punishment and the concept of, well, you know, if you're not behaving well, God is always watching. Now that's a common phrase that comes out of a lot of parents' mouths, right? You know, look, if I can lie or I can cheat or I can steal and nobody sees it and I don't get caught, well then, you know, what is the consequence? Sometimes a parent will say, God is always watching. Um, now I find this to be, you know, uh, an interesting thing to talk about, but I don't want to get into it there. I want to talk about what goes on in society once we become adults. Because again, I observe that there are people that are, in air quotes now, religious leaders who come out and make statements and they tell you how the world should be functioning. They sometimes tell you what political candidates you're supposed to be backing. They sometimes tell you what political party is right or wrong. They sometimes tell you about things like abortion. They sometimes tell you about things like alcohol or drug use or whatever. And they make these statements to the public with the legitimacy attached to them simply because there's somebody who leads a church or there's somebody who is generally thought of to be a religious leader. And therefore, their statements, their ideas, their concepts, their opinions even, are supposed to carry a heavier weight. And I'm trying to find, in my mind anyway, where it is in the biblical text (laughs) that this becomes part of the reality, you know, the priest class or those who can remotely sort of rub the legitimacy of being part of the priest class can then sort of hijack that very deeply ingrained thing that was given to us by our parents, that concept that the representative of God is watching, you know, and making judgments and statements. And I think that this is actually the most dangerous thing about those who have hijacked and been badly taught about religion in general and God in, tr- in, in in reality or source or the higher power or whatever it is you want to call it, I think that this is highly dangerous because there's a lot of people that act in their own ways to manipulate the masses. And sometimes they're part of a grand conspiracy and sometimes just like in any other walk of life, They're really just useful idiots who are doing the bidding of, well, somebody. What do you think about this idea that's rolling around in my mind? It's not really a question, but but really just something I'd like you to speak to a little bit, if you wouldn't mind. Because, you know, we, we talk about how the history has kind of been manipulated. The text has been manipulated. The concept has been manipulated. And there is a lot of truth, but there's also a lot of danger in weaponizing people's superstitions, honest-to-goodness religious beliefs, uh, and and their spirituality in general, the hijacking of it, the utilization of it to steer the population. I'd like to get your general thoughts on that before we get into the questions from the listeners, if you don't mind. Yes. Well, the whole subject that you just brought up reminds me of many scriptures that I have seen in the Bible where I recall it says more than one time God says my people are dying from a lack of knowledge. He doesn't say yeah all the the Hindus and all the Buddhists and all these people are dying from knowledge from a lack of knowledge. No he says my people in the Christian Bible my people are dying from a lack of knowledge. And then there's another scripture in the Old Testament that says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Or other other Bible reference works say, where there is no vision, the people are dying. Well, the scripture says, my people are dying from a lack of knowledge. Why? Because they have no vision. And then we're told in the New Testament, we're told in the New Testament that Satan is the god of this world. Mm. P, at the end of sentence, uh, Satan is the god of this world. And it doesn't say that Satan is the god of this world except for America Mm. or except for England. 
No, Satan is the god of this world, period. End of sentence. And so the blind leading the blind, and both shall fall into the pit. And so what we have today are people who, for whatever reason, see themselves as great teachers, but by their fruits you shall know them, as another scripture comes to my mind. Mm. What is the fruitage of all of these holy people with all their holy advice? What is the fruitage in Christianity and Judaism? Well, in Judaism and Christianity, all of the great teachers and rabbis, what is the fruitage? The fruitage is world wars, two massive world wars fought within Christendom, fought within Europe and America. Christian countries. And so what is the fruitage of Christianity? The, uh, the, uh, the incredible fruitage that we have reaped from Christianity for the last 2,000 years has been wars and violence, occultism, alcoholism, just an incredible array of horrible tragedies and wars and violence and people are confused and marriages are being broken up and children are on drugs. Uh, it's just an, an incredible world that we have been given when we follow the religions today. And the reason why is because so very, very few people actually have the ability to go and read and study and pay and pay many years of attention over and over, reading and studying about theology and religions and where they come from and study the words, the terms, the etymology, the concepts and the ideas. Very few people have ever done that. Very few people care to do that. And so I learned a long time ago <clears throat> that Everyone has a belief system or everyone who has a belief system, usually they have whatever belief system that they believe is a part of their culture where they were born. Mm. So that if you're born in the middle of, 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 uh, of Christendom, you'll have a Christian idea about life. And if you're born in the middle of Africa, then you, you will take on the African understanding of life and their philosophy, or if you're born in China, then you will have a Chinese view of life with the, with the Chinese view of, of you know, theology and religion. <clears throat> it just depends on where you, by chance, happen to have been born will give you the bottom line for where you believe what you believe. See, but let me interrupt As, you here, because here's the thing. A lot of people believe that they have a special connection because of their culture too. their culture is righteous the other cultures are not the other cultures are savage theirs is more in tune with god themselves i mean this is literally the kind of stuff that comes out of the mouths of uh some well-meaning yeah. people but also some maniacs will say the very same thing yeah the right? jim jones of the world sure uh, but here's the thing i take it back to the point you made earlier the concept that it tells you right in the scripture that this world is this world, the entire thing doesn't matter if it's in China or if it's in Idaho. OK, if it's in Russia or if it's in uh, Venezuela, it, it's irrelevant because the entire world at this point in time is not ruled by the God you would generally think it would be. And that That's they right. keep telling you it is because it says right there in the scripture, it's in the hands of the adversary, really. And we, we, we know what we've come to understand about that. Mm -hmm. But that's the truth of it. This this idea that, well, gee, since I was born in America, uh, you know, then that gives me this special place in the world. I don't think the gods care about the invisible lines that have been drawn on maps by men. I don't think that they care very much about the languages we speak necessarily. I don't think, you know, I mean, this is just me. And maybe it's because I'm just, you know, 
far in that that odd category that, like I told you before, is sort of pagan. But the reality is that according to what I can read here, you got to accept that we are not in the hands of the benefactor that would be benevolent at this point. That's right. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, a um, couple things came up in questions, and I want to enter them here because I think they're going to lead into an interesting direction from where you started. All right? Well, so, let me add one more scripture that's oh, sure. very important. Sure, sure. The Bible has in the New Testament, the Bible has the uh, the Bible writer in the New Testament, I remember, said something very interesting. It says, you, God supposedly said to the people of his day, of that day, you have formed for yourselves teachers. You have formed for yourselves teachers. <clears throat> and so what you are teaching are man-made things, and you have made void the laws of God by your traditions of your teachings. The problem is you have formed for yourselves teachers. That's what there's where we get in trouble mm -hmm. because we humans get together as organizations, as societies, as people, and in secret societies and governmental groups will get together and we will form an idea about what it is <clears throat> that we believe. <clears throat> Excuse me. And therefore, we will follow, we will then put up the money and the in the effort to build a university, a college. Now we, in order to be a minister in that particular religion, you have to go to this university, this college, and get a degree. And so now you have to study what I wrote in the book. You have to study it. And then I will give you the imprimatur of my name, and I will let you now be a minister because you are, you've learned what to say and what not to say and how to teach it and what I want you to believe. And so government now has the control over what it is the people of the nation will believe. And so you have formed for yourselves teachers. And that's what we've done. We have churches and seminaries that are, are teaching young people how to think and what to think and where things come from and, and how they want you to understand things so that you can go out and take the message to the rest of the world. And so that's the problem. We have formed for ourselves our teachers. <clears throat> and we have to go to school and take the test. And uh, and get the right answers, and then you get the imprimatur of the government putting a, giving you a degree, and now you can come out, and now you're a minister. Is that what Jesus did with the twelve apostles? You have to go and take a test and go to the seminary, which is actually a seminary, which ha in involves the whole worship of sex, and it's just an incredible uh, monstrosity that we humans have formed for ourselves universities, colleges, mm. schools, and ideas, and we teach the young people, here is the real truth, according to Uncle Ed and according to Grandma, here is the real truth, and you need to take this test and write it down, and if you, get, if you say the right things and take the, take the test and write down the correct answers, then you go to the university and get a degree, and now you can be a minister. But we don't want you out there talking because the Spirit has moved you, because God is dealing with you, because the great Spirit in the universe is moving you to do something and wanting to do something. No, you go to the college and, and, and sign the application and pay the money. Mm. And go into the classroom and shut up and don't get any ideas about what's going on. We will tell you what to say and we'll tell you what you can say and what you can't. And if you're a good boy and you do what we tell you to do mm -hmm. <clears throat> and answer all the questions that we give you correctly, <clears throat> then we'll give you the opportunity to be a minister. Now you can go out and teach <clears throat> the religion because we have formed for ourselves our teachers, mm. and that's what's wrong, because we, 
informing for ourselves, teachers, we don't even know what's going on to start with. And yet we have come up with the best we can come up with as ignorant and ill-informed, unread, simple-minded creatures. And we have put it together into a university and teaching all the other simple-minded creatures what to say and what to believe. And today, that's why we say, by their fruits, you shall know them. Look at the fruitage of what our silly religions that we have formed and we've decided what is right and wrong. And we're teaching what we think is right. We're teaching everybody to believe what we want them to believe. And therefore, now we've got nothing but seven and a half billion people who are totally intellectually and spiritually lost. Mm. They have no ability to think for themselves, no ability to question anything. You have no idea how many times I get people calling and emailing me and saying, Jordan, there's so much to learn. Where do I start? <coughs> and so this is the problem we have formed for ourselves, hmm. teachers. Nobody seems to know anything for sure. It's just what they were taught to believe. Right. And, you know, I, I, again, I think a good place to start is with the uh, – w- w- once you've learned what it is you generally learn, I think a good place to start is this series we've been doing uh, because th- th- this is the opening round of a lot of different discussions, and uh, uh, we've gone in a lot of different directions here. With that in mind, I want to enter something into the, the discussion from a listener now. I, I don't have their name. I have their email address, so I'm just going to call them Mo. Based on their email address. Okay. <laughs> uh, Mo asks uh, th- this interesting question. I, I want to tail on with something here because I think that this question is going to go a lot deeper than the listener even thought. Um, so here we go. Uh, might the idea of a future global war fought over water have more to do with the coming age of Aquarius uh, rather than uh, the shortage of fresh water. That is their question. But I want to add something here. Um, to me, this has nothing to do with Aquarius. It's, in fact, a much more scary thing because it is literally, if you think about it, water in and of itself is life. So th- there, there is nothing on this planet that survives without it. So... When people are battling over resources, yeah, oil, I realize, is an important thing, and plenty of blood has been spilled, and listen, blood has been spilled, will be spilled, and is being spilled uh, continuously for various resources, diamonds, you know, natural gas, uh, steel, it doesn't matter. Different parts of our history show us this, but the fact that it's now being turned uh, to water is interesting because at the end of the day, there is no one, no matter what their riches are, no matter what their uh, 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 power is or ability to move a vehicle or anything else, you know, it's it's all irrelevant if you have a locked control over life itself. And to control water is to control life. I, I think it's got a lot more to do with that than Aquarius easily. And uh, I think that that's a much more scary thing. I think it's also, uh, uh, you know, dare I say it, it's actually a ritualistic, magical kind of thing that's going on when people are beginning to battle over these these elements, these very basic elements of life itself, more than oil, more than anything else that's ever been battled over. So, Jordan, again, the question is, uh, you know, do you think that this has to do with the coming age of Aquarius? Uh, and I add the question, do you think that there is an esoteric aspect to this that is actually ritualistic, actually magical, and not in the magical, wonderful world of whatever sort of way, but uh, but really in a deep, dark sort of uh, we're going to get a stranglehold over life itself on the planet kind of agenda, which goes right to serving the adversary uh, who does indeed rule this particular world. So those two questions, I throw at you, and I think that uh, this this is going to be a, a dark and deep subject immediately. But keep in mind, the first part of it is, uh, does it have to do with the coming age of Aquarius, the fact that this is happening? And uh, 
And secondly, you know, do, do you want to speak to the more esoteric aspects of the battle over water on the planet uh, in a religious context? Well, uh, I don't think Aquarius is going to affect us that are listening today because it's not going to be around for another couple, 300 years. We're not in the age of Aquarius yet and won't be around for at least a couple, three, maybe 400 years yet before Aquarius will be here officially. And obviously, there's going to be a symbolic implication to the world of the age of Aquarius. It, Sometimes I've often thought it meant a time when the world will be washed up. <laughs> and that's what we're looking at. We're, we're getting to the point where we're running out of everything, uh, running out of answers and we're running out of materials. We're running out of everything. We're running out of our, our out of our minds. And so it looks like maybe the world's going to be washed clean of all the ludicrous ludicrous stuff that we're into maybe that's what it means but i am i know that aquarius is no longer going to be a problem we're going to have to deal with we who are living today because it's not coming for a few quite a few years <clears throat> because you've got to know where did the other uh, astrological signs begin and where was the one just before us the one we're in right now is Pisces. Well, in order to know when Aquarius arrives officially, you have to know when, where did Pisces, the one we're in now, where did that age officially begin? <clears throat> and so each, each age is 2,150 years long. Well, if each age is 2,100 years long, when did Aquarius, when did Pisces begin? The age of Pisces with the two fish, which is the age of religion. Well, we, we've been involved with religion and churches and faith and all of that for the past 1,600 years since the founding of the Catholic Church 1,600 years ago and the Vatican <clears throat> and the age of Aquarius, it seems to point to the fact that age of Aquarius officially began about the 4th century A.D. That's what the best I can come up with, the best uh, evaluations I have seen. Mm. That makes sense to me is that <clears throat> uh, uh, Pisces began around, around the 4th century A.D., and, and our time in A.D. And so you count 2,150 years from the 4th century A.D., and that puts, it, that puts us at the beginning of the age of Aquarius in somewhere around 2,400-something. Mm. Well, we're in 21, so we've got about 300 and some odd years to go yet. But this is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. This is not the age. This is the dawning of the age. That's what the song says. And why do we call it the dawning? Because the sun has not risen yet in the age of Aquarius. It hasn't come up. The stars on the eastern, you know, on the eastern horizon are not in Aquarius. They're still in Pisces. Right, and we and talked so, at length about the dawning of and, and the idea that there are effects before you can actually see the sun when the dawning is occurring. So this isn't literally when the sun is up uh, that's right. in, when you're talking about dawning. And the thing is that uh, when when you put it together here uh, and, you, and you say, okay, 4th century, that means that when the calendar read about 300 is yep. when this happens. So if the calendar's reading 2,000 now, that means the calendar's got to read 2,400 in order to even get there. Uh, but in all fairness, the, the listener did ask the coming age. Is, does it have to do with the coming age of Aquarius, which, you know, in, in a uh, relative sort of way is, is soon to happen, but hasn't yet happened, obviously, like you said. So do, do you think that that has anything to do with this battle that's going on over the resource of water? at this time well i think maybe that has something to do with it but i'm also interested in the fact that all financial institutions of the world of mankind operate under something called maritime admiralty law maritime admiralty law is referred to in law as the law of the sea the law of water 
And that's why we say money goes through your hands like water. No, money is water. And so Aquarius is a sign of the man with the water pitcher pouring water out into the earth. So it seems there was an incredibly important book put out on this subject by a professor in Texas. The name of the book was called Fire and Ice. Get it if you can find it. Fire and Ice, and I think his name was Professor Flowers. Professor Flowers okay. wrote a book called Fire and Ice, and in it he talks about the coming age of Aquarius and ties it connecting it directly to the brotherhood of Saturn or the powers behind the uh, the world revolutionary movement of Adolf Hitler and the Soviet communism especially with Adolf Hitler and the Germanic peoples of the world, and shows how this whole idea of the coming of the age of Aquarius is not going to be very pretty. Mm. It's not going to be happy. This is the kind of stuff Adolf Hitler was preparing the world for. Well, if that's the case, then you have to know it's going to be an incredible world we're going to live in, because Adolf Hitler realized that there was coming an age of Aquarius, and he was preparing the world for that. And so what happened to the Earth during the Second World War? Well, that's what's going to happen to the Earth in the coming of the age of Aquarius. It's going to be very, very different than you think it is. It's not going to be some happy la-la land. Uh, imagined by spiritual people who think the age of Aquarius is going to be so wonderful. No, go back and read the book Fire and Ice by uh, by Professor Flowers. In it, he talks about how there's going to be a lot of strange connections to that age of Aquarius with other astrological signs implicated in it, what it really means it's going to be like, what the world's going to be like when it hits the age of Aquarius. And it's a very powerful book, Fire and Ice. And I think that the world is going to be a horrible place to live in. It's going to be a tragic, horrible place to live in when we hit the age of Aquarius officially. And I think the reason why is because look what we humans have come from in the past 200 years, a little over 200 years from the founding of our great republic to the horrible world of tyranny, communism, Marxist, Leninist, communism, fascism, bloodletting, murderers, and all kinds of horrible things going on in the world today. Look where we have gone down. Look where we have fallen down to. Well, just sit tight because the world's not getting any better. It's getting worse and worse by the day. And so where are we going to be in the next 300 years when the age of Aquarius begins? Begins, And I have no idea how bad it's going to be. But from the past 250 years, we have really hit the bottom today. And our country is being destroyed from inside. And like the Bible has, like the Bible has said, no House can uh, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Well, if there's ever been a house divided against itself, it's America. One half of our country hates our country. One half of our country hates the president. They hate the government. They want to destroy this country. They want to destroy uh, what we have built, what people have died to build in this country give us freedom and liberty and justice and a wonderful uh, way of life in relation to the rest of the world. But one half of the country are fascist, murdering morons who want to destroy this country and destroy its government and destroy the people and give away our country to foreign people. And so I know that, you know, given the fact that a house divided against itself cannot stand I don't know how much longer America is going to be alive, how much longer we're going to actually live mm. in the country that we live in and experiencing the wonderful life that we live here today in America because a house divided against itself cannot stand, and we are falling very quickly. And the reason why is we have allowed the tyranny 
of fascists and murderers to teach our children. They have been university professors who have been teaching our children revolution, violence, pornography, uh, revolution, uh, all kinds of you know, subversive teachings in universities and not allowing the university students to express themselves. Yeah. We have something called political correctness where you cannot open your mouth and say what you think because you'll be mocked and laughed at or kicked out of university. And if the professors try and explain to you what's really going on, they will lose their job and so I see the whole of Western civilization and humanity in general certainly going toward a day of incredible collapse. Mm. That's where we're going. That's where we're heading for. A world collapse is coming, and we cannot continue to do the things that we've done and view the world the way we view it and promoting the bloodshed and the violence and the crap that we are in, in education and in universities and in entertainment, movies, all the pornography, violence, sex and drug rituals and religion. We're not going to continue. Something is going to happen to the world of mankind. And I know and I can feel it coming. I know that we're coming to a place where we're going to collapse. And when we do, it's going to be a horrible situation. And God knows how it's actually going to look and what the world is going to look like in the age of Aquarius. But from what, but, but from what Professor Flowers wrote in his book, Fire and Ice, it's not going to be very pretty. If you start mm. looking at all the accompanying information in astrology is that the age is coming is going to be a very very seriously uh incredibly bad thing coming for us we are heading down a wrong road and it's it's just too bad because i know that most people have no idea in the world what i'm talking about but our future is very very dark Right. And you know what the thing is, is that the intentions of what was laid out uh, with this country are, are uh, honorable. Uh, the problem right. is that, uh, you know, in, in my estimation, I, I, I am often seen as somebody who, who, who makes a lot of statements that sound like I would like to see the place destroyed. That's not true. What I would like to see is the cancer dealt with. There mm -hmm. is a cancer. On this entire nation, there is a cancer on this planet. And I believe, just like any other living organism, if you change the diet going into that living organism, you change the things that fuel the cancer cells. You of change course. the things that fuel the good cells in the body. If you change the diet. So if, if, if you're able to alter the education system, if you're able to alter the the root of the problem, and we're about to get to another root of the problem in a second, if you're able to alter the root of the problem in the constant diet that's being fed into the living organism, then you may not have the autoimmune response that's going on where the body is literally battling parts of itself. It, it, it is just that simple. And I think that that's something that, that could stand around the planet. There's a lot of interesting ways that, uh, that other governments, other societies have been organized. And I think without this particular cancer that's gotten into the system of the entire organism. Now, maybe, you know, one part of the world you could consider the arm or the leg or whatever, but it's all connected. Okay. If we can figure out a way to deal with the cancer, there's a possibility of turning this back around. But if not, the results will go just like a cancer ravaging a body. And that's the way it is. I mean, the way I see it. To go, to one, totally of, agree. To go to one of these uh, roots of it <laughs> is another question. Uh, from a listener who's actually in the chat room and sent an email. Uh, and, and this is about the city of London. <laughs> yep, London is, is in the middle of this mess. They well, have caused most of it. Like I, like I said, one of the roots of the problem, right? Mm -hmm. um, also, there's a comment here about maritime law, and uh, quite frankly, I think that should be a standalone episode where basically I just throw the subject on the table and let Jordan run with it uh, to to explain it 
and to uh, to get people into the idea that the application of it as it stands now and as it used to stand and give a historical sort of perspective of it, I think that should be done on a separate show, Jordan. Uh, mm-hmm. What do you think? Okay. I think you're right because it will require at least a couple of hours of uninterrupted where I can just start from one square and walk and you know and work out and w- walk right through it because they're they're yeah. saying look you know I've heard a lot of different things about it but I don't necessarily understand the basics and uh, I would like to hear about that more so I, I think we'll we'll save that for a future show uh, and and again it ties right into what it is we're talking about and it's kind of interesting to me too that. We're in the age of Pisces, and just in a, in a literal sense, uh, there there is a, a, a genocidal movement against the very symbol of Pisces that's going on on the planet right now. In mm-hmm. the in the oceans, uh, there there are many species that are being entirely wiped out uh, by you know by by nuclear waste and uh, by the plastic industries and you know the oil industries and all of these corporate entities You're are. Right really at a at a breakneck pace at an alarming speed destroying species after species of aquatic life i find it interesting that the age of a uh, 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 pisces may indeed be culminating in the absolute death of the ocean and uh you know hate to be a doomsayer here but the fact is that if the ocean dies everything else on this planet will go with it you can I, bet on it. I don't yeah. think people understand that, but uh, but that's something that needs to be recognized as well. Um, now, on to the city of London, <laughs> because, yeah. uh, again, I want to give most of the time to the listener questions here. Um, let's see. Consider discussing the city of London specifically. What is it now? This comes from, uh, hmm, let's see now, er- Ehrman is, I believe, the way this name is pronounced. If I mispronounced your name, I apologize, but I believe your name is pronounced Ehrman. Uh, anyway, the question here is, okay, uh, I'm not sure if this has to do with religion. The city of London has always been um, influential world events. Okay, uh, basically, why is the city of London a separate thing from you know, London, first of all, but mm-hmm. also uh, they, they cite a bunch of uh, interesting things and they, they sort of saw a video on it that has them asking a lot of general questions. Uh, you know, for instance, the queen herself cannot even enter the city of London without an alderman apparently with her. Uh, but the queen actually is utilizing the king's office, by the way. The, mm-hmm. the, the queen is not on her own authority, a monarch. She is in the office of the king, actually, um, and by extension yeah. is then allowed, the king is not even allowed, or the office of the king is not even allowed in the city of London without an alderman with her. I, I don't know precisely how to explain this, but the city of London and its role, I guess, uh, in the religious structure, in the political structure, in the separation, the symbology of it, in general, I think is something that uh, you could probably tackle for a little while here. Um, I do also mention that I've done shows on what's adjacent to the city of London, which is rather interesting as well, um, because there has been a lot of massive ritualization of the land there that uh, we call Great Britain or England or whatever. But meanwhile, the city of London is separate from London, and it's uh, actually a separate entity onto itself. Maybe you could sort of explain that. And yeah, um, there yeah, is in if you go to England, go to the city that everyone knows is London. There is in London a square. I think it's a square mile, one square mile within the greater city of London, and it is called. The, t- the term that is given to that ten, that one mile square is referred to as, quote, the city, end quote. And people in London know what that means. So when you say if you're living in London, you're going to go into the banking area where all the international banks are. You're getting up and you're going into the city of London. 
And so there are two cities in, in England. One is called London, which is the big London or the greater London. That's the, that's the city everybody in the world knows and, of and thinks of. And then there's a one-mile square what's inside the, the city of London that's called the city, period, mm. the city. And the city is a one-mile square of all the international banks of the world. All the banks of the world have their home offices and their major connections in within that one-mile square in London. <clears throat> so all of the banking going around the world is going through the city of London, that mm -hmm. one mile square. It has nothing whatsoever to do with the greater city of London where the people live. There has no, nothing to do with the greater city of London. The people have nothing to do with that one mile square. It's a privately owned by the people who own that one mile square of banks are referred to as the crown. So the Queen of England has zero, nothing whatsoever to do with the crown. There are colonies around the world that England owns, and England they're called English uh, uh, English uh, colonies. <clears throat> but there are certain places in the world that the English England has nothing to do with. They're referred to as crown colonies because there is no connection whatsoever between the English, uh, the English queen, the queen of England, and the crown. <clears throat> the word crown is referring to a, a, a very powerful secret society of Freemasons. They're called Knights Templar Freemasonic Order. They're Freemasonic Order out of England. They're referred to in England by people who are on the inside. They refer to the Secret Society of Freemasons as the crown. And they own everything, period, including the queen. She must go on her knees once a year. She must go on her knees before the Secret Society of Freemasons in England and bow down on her knees and ask permission to open up Parliament, to open up the government of England. <clears throat> she must go on her knees and, and, and go before the Lord Mayor of London, the One Mile Square. Mm. And she must ask permission to open up the government for the year in England. And where does she go on her knees? She goes to the Crown. She goes to that secret society of Freemasons, in England, that's referred to as the British Grand Lodge, the British International World Illuminati Grand Lodge that controls not just that one mile square of banks, but the banks themselves throughout the world are actually put there by the crown. has nothing to do with the royal family. The royal family are useless and worthless. The people who run England, run the world, and they're referred to as the crown. The crown. <clears throat> the crown is a secret society of Freemasons, and that crown colonies and that crown banking is also the people who own and, and operate what we call the Federal Reserve System in America. The British Crown Freemasonic Order, the secret society of Freemasons out of England, run America. They run the Federal Reserve. They print your money. They print your dollar bills. They print and organize your banks. And ultimately, not only your banks, but your money. And your money also, they control your religions, your churches, your synagogues. Your whole entire life is ruled by the people, the secret societies called the Knights Templars, who were the people who run the one mile square in London called the crown. Mm. And so that's why you're having all the horrible stuff going on because there's nothing you can do about your situation in America. You can cry about it. You can complain about it. You can see all the corruption, but there's nothing you can do about it because the secret societies of Freemasons in England name and by, by name are referred to as the Knights Templars. The Knights Templars control 
the entire inhabited earth and the flow of money. That's why it's called the one mile square. It belongs to the crown, and they call themselves the city, the city of London. And that's why, incidentally, in the Bible and the book of Revelation, in the Bible talks about when the demons who run this world say that we are a city. We, it says in Revelation, I am a city. And I have a kingdom over the kings of the earth. Here in the city, this is what the Bible says, the city has a kingdom over the kings of the earth, period. Not just over London, not just over Europe. No, the kingdom of the city actually controls the kings of this world. It's all about money and political power that comes from the creation of money. The Federal Reserve, America on its knees and dying because of the Federal Reserve, owned and operated by the city of Freemasons in England. You need to wake up and get a life and learn for the first time how your government actually works and who actually owns your country called the United States. Because we are no longer the United States of America. We no longer use that term legally in law today. Yeah. We are referred to as the United States Corporation. We are a privately owned company, a subsidiary of a far larger and, and far more ancient corporation called the Vatican. And under the Vatican, there is a corporation called the City. It's a Masonic order out of, out of London that controls the banking institutions of this world, and one of them is the Federal Reserve in Washington, D.C. So Americans need to wake up and find out that they are nothing more than our products. They are the offspring of the, of the governments that own them. The United right. States Corporation is no longer the United States of America. We're not united. But the United States Corporation, it's a company, owns you, and it owns your body, it owns your family, it owns your children, it owns your wife, your husband. It, we, if we're human, the United States owns your body. You have, your body as a security on the New York Stock Exchange. Why? Because Rome, when it dominated Europe, operated in Europe and operated in England out of the city of York, England. That's where Caesar ruled England from, was from York. Well, today we have a new York. Right. And New York is the center for the new world order, the United Nations. It's all English, British, international money. It's an incredible betrayal of the human race by the Knights Templars in London. We need to wake up and find out who these people really are, this Grand Lodge of England, and how it dominates America's political, economic, and its human life. We are nothing more than slaves to an ancient secret society out of London. You need to wake up and find out who these people are and how it really works and why the people of England are on their knees, the Queen of England is on her knees, to the city of London, a one mile square of international banks. Mm. It's an incredible story. My God, we need to wake up and find out where we are in the stream of time and where we're going as a country. Right. That's and as, why as we you have as all you, the hatred going on for our president. Well, there you go. But as, as you mentioned, the stream of time. Uh, it is appropriate to bring up two quick questions here, which are, uh, which are brought up based on what you were just saying. Uh, first of all is, uh, the question about, what is it now? Let's see. Okay. Uh, blah, blah, blah. right. Was, was maritime admiralty law started in the city of London is a question. Uh, the other question is, does this explain why it is they describe the legal society in England and the United States, in some places, as the Crown Temple Bar Association. Precisely. The Crown is the secret society of Freemasons. They are referred to, quote, as the Crown, end quote. End quote. 
So when you talk about the crown, you're talking about a Masonic order called the British Grand Lodge of Freemasons. It has got zero, nothing to do with the Holy Mother, Queen Mum, and Prince Charles, and all that inbred, goofy family of Nazis and fascists and SS Gestapo Germans. They call the, the royalty of England. They're nothing but a bunch of German Nazis. But when you use the term crown, you're talking about the British Grand Lodge of World Freemasonry that controls international banking fraternities around the world, period. Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade and Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark were telling you all about the crown. You need to go back and watch Spielberg and George Lucas's movies about the crown. They're telling you that there's a secret society running our world who are printing your money, who have given you your governments, they've given you your churches, your synagogues. And when you talk, and when Jews will tell you in the Bible about Gog and Magog, that's a scripture in the Bible talks about Gog and Magog. Supposedly, that's a term used by for evil influences in, in the world, Gog and Magog. Gog and Magog, look it up in the dictionary, are two little midget gods who guard the crown. It's mm -hmm. inside that one mile square are symbols and statues of Gog and Magog. It's a, it's a symbolism of secret societies in the demonic depravity and demonism, which is going on inside that one mile square, run by the Knights Templars, who were the who were running behind the scenes and financing Adolf Hitler, financing the Communist Party, financing world revolution with the international banks of the world. It's an incredible story that you need to wake up and start doing some research on. The British crown, and what does it mean? Mm. Crown does not mean anything with royalty. No. It's a secret society of Freemasons who run the entire financial structure of the world behind the scenes, and they are misleading the whole human race into a total concentration camp where there will be no longer any freedom liberty, justice, or any ability to speak at all. They're shutting everybody down. They're mm. shutting down people who are trying to, and America is the last place where the freedom to speak is now under, under attack. They are shutting down people like me who are trying to wake the people up because the crown, that one mile square of international banking elites, do not want this kind of information out. <clears throat> and I'm doing the best I can with nothing to try and wake America's people up to what's really going on with the Federal Reserve and the British Crown and the Knights Templar Masonic Order. My God, we need to wake up. Absolutely true. Now, we're going to go to a break, but maybe in the next hour we'll actually get into that because that's fascinating to me, the roots of the phrase or the uh, composite word demagoguery, right, or to be a demagogue. Uh, this is pretty interesting to me because, uh, quite frankly, I've, I've often asked this and I never bothered to ask you about the, the term gog uh, and, and what it actually means, but... Uh, uh, it, it's it's really fascinating. Also, uh, we have a, a, another question that'll that'll be added into the next hour, and that's uh, that's related to some of this symbolism uh, in the iconography of, of Christianity. Um, but any other questions that you guys have, feel free to drop them into the chat room or to tweet them at me during the live show. If not, email me info at ocelli.com. I will save them for the next time I sit down with Jordan. And if not, you can email them to Jordan at his website where there is a contact slot over there. You, you click on it. You can email directly to Jordan at Jordan Maxwell show. Dot com. You got to put all those words together because that is the only website. That is Jordan Maxwell's Jordan Ocelli Maxwell Show now here at Ocelli.com. And I'm not going to waste any time going through anything else because I want to get right back to Jordan Maxwell, who, by the way, has a website, which is the only 
and I do mean only, I stress the word only, website that is actually Jordan Maxwell's. It is jordanmaxwellshow.com. Over there, you can join the Research Society for a one-time fee that uh, gives you a lifetime subscription and get much deeper into the topics that we're talking about tonight, along with a great many other things, including uh, a whole lot of research you won't find anywhere else, uh, references, audio, video, uh, books and, uh, well, you know, reading lists, if you will, articles, images, all kinds of stuff. And it's, uh, being constantly added to terabytes of information still waiting to, uh, be added to it. But anyway, uh, that is the research society, which you can get to by going to Jordan Maxwell show.com. And if you go there, you can also contact Jordan. You can take a look at the public area. You could make a donation toward Jordan's well being, which is the way that, uh, that that gets done nowadays because that's the only way that you get to show appreciation to somebody is if you voluntarily take care of it. Nobody is going to go into massive business with Jordan at the moment. Because the people that are, you know, making those sorts of investments are not really interested in the truth. So, you know what? You, you, you value Jordan, show him. And, uh, join the research society. That, that goes to the webmaster, by the way, the research society fee in order to, uh, keep that part of the site going. But if you make a donation to Jordan, it goes toward his, well, you know, hate to, hate to make it sound animalistic, Jordan, but kind of like your care, feeding, and well-being. <laughs> Is is uh, definitely uh, something that they would be contributing to if they dropped in something into the uh, donation bucket over at jordanmaxwellshow.com. dot um, and and I put that that way for myself too when I you know mention that I have a donate button as well. Uh, same thing I say you know it's for the care and feeding of the uh, the dummy who's the host over here, but uh, <laughs> but of course it's not a dummy over at jordanmaxwellshow.com. dot com. Uh, Jordan has been a teacher for a very long time, in fact, more than a half a century, trying to enlighten people and get them to wake the hell up. Anyway, we continue on with this discussion, and I'm going to enter the rest of the questions that I have backed up here into the discussion. Uh, when we went to break, we were talking about uh, the gogs, and, of course, the phrase demigog is interesting. Jordan explained that if you missed the first hour just a bit. But um, somebody asked a question which is now in another direction, which I'd like to get to, uh, and it is regarding the individuals that are sitting at the right and left hand of the Christ figure in the Last Supper. Now, of course, this is an iconic image. We know from whence it came. We know that it was commissioned by the church. We know that uh, a brilliant individual had actually created it. Um, and it is a fascinating image. <laughs> That's for sure. We remember the, uh, interesting controversies of things like, well, you know, the Dan Brown novels and all that kind of stuff and the Da Vinci Code and so on and so forth. But how about we get to the reality of it? There's two people sitting at the right and left of the Christ image in the Last Supper. Um, perhaps Jordan, you'd like to explain what those two individuals are and what they represent. <laughs> Well, first of all, we need to explain that there are 12 individuals, on uh, six on each side of Jesus. That's important. Why is there 12 people at the Last Supper? The Last Supper is, of course, the last Passover meal because the Jews separated, they celebrated uh, the coming of spring, the, the new spring each year. They call it the Passover because the sun was passing officially over the equator, coming back to the northern hemisphere. So they celebrated what we call today, what Christians call Easter. They, The, the Jews had an Easter also, but they called it the Passover. And the Passover was the sun passing over from the southern uh, part of the planet to the across the equator. They passed over the equator, the sun did, bringing us our new life to, from spring. So it was dead in winter, so it's springing back to life in spring. And so the 12 people at the table with Jesus represents the 12 months of the year with the sun. Jesus is referred to as the sun. And, and, and there's only one Jesus. But why? Because there's only one sun. We don't have six of them. We only got one sun that warms the earth and brings light to the world. 
So Jesus is referred to as the light of the world. Of course, he's God's son, the light of the world. And so to the right of Jesus, you will see at the table is a woman, one of the 12, one of the 12 months of the year, one of the chosen 12 apostles or the 12 brothers of Joseph or the 12 tribes of Israel or the 12 uh, 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 on, on the breastplate of the high priest, the 12 stones, the sacred stones. Everything in the Bible is done in a sequence of 12. Why? Because there's only 12 months in the year. And the 12 months of the year, uh, the sun is giving light to the world. And so, therefore, the, uh, the last Passover meal will be in the age of Aquarius for us. And so it's called the last, the last supper. No, it's the last Passover meal. Mm. And so to the right of Jesus, you will see a woman. She is considered to be one of the 12 apostles, was a woman. Why? Because the 12 apostles represent the 12 months of the year or the 12 signs of the zodiac. And one of the primary symbols of the zodiac uh, is a female symbol, and it's called, uh, the female is called Virgo, the virgin. This is why Jesus is said to have been born of a virgin, because spring was always represented by Virgo, the constellation in the zodiac called Virgo, Virgo the Virgin. So naturally, one of the guests at the uh, at the Last Supper would be Virgo the Virgin, Jesus' mother. And so Jesus is born of a virgin. No, Virgo, the Virgin is Virgo, the constellation of Virgo as one of the 12 signs of the Zodiac. And so the one on the right, as you will see, is a woman, which is Virgo. I don't remember. I don't have the picture in front of me, or the picture of the person on the, on the left. But you will see all 12 are divided into four groups of three. There's three groups on the, on the one side and three groups next to it, then Jesus, and there's three groups. And there's a third, and there's a fourth group of three. So why are there four groups of three? Because it's summer, sp spring, summer, autumn, winter. The four symbols of the sun in the age of the life of the sun. Right. The four seasons. The four seasons are the four groups of three. You know? and so each season is referred to as three months of the year. And so that's why today we see that the constellations of the 12 signs of the zodiac with their master teacher which is the sun the sun is giving his life so that you might live and mm. the reason why is because the sun is pure energy and if it didn't give you energy every day you couldn't grow food and you couldn't grow nothing and you would be dead if it doesn't rise tomorrow so that's why we have a risen sun and there's only one sun out there. We don't have five of them. So, therefore, Jesus is the only begotten sun. He's the only sun we have is God's sun, the light of the world. So the whole story of the New Testament is astrological. It's called astrotheology. If you go back into history and trace all of this, trace it all back, you will see it goes back to Hinduism. Mm. It goes back to ancient Egypt and the Hindus. This is an incredible story that has been misrepresented to the world, and that's why there's so much confusion today. So just keep in mind that that whole uh, picture of the, of the Last Supper is actually an astrological symbol of the sun, God's son, the light of the world, the son we call Jesus, he's in the middle of his 12 months of the year or the 12 signs of the zodiac. Each right. one of those individuals represents one of the signs of the zodiac. Well, a couple of things here really quickly. First of all, I misunderstood part of this person's question because they were actually asking uh, about who was at the left and the right of the Christ figure when he was being crucified the symbolism in that is, oh, okay, okay. is, uh, okay, is, different. The, yeah. is, is different. Uh, yeah. you know, and people have made different, um, 
well, different concepts available out there. Like this is a Passover Seder, which I agree with. Some people have said that, uh, you know, in the, again, the Last Supper, uh, that this uh, was also a, a wedding feast, which I disagree with. It wouldn't have been blatantly done that way because Da Vinci had been commissioned by the church to do this. I don't think that that would have been part of the equation, at least not up front. <laughs> uh, you know, is there a lot of hidden symbols in the... Last Supper imagery, I think there is, but oh yeah, but that's not is. what they were asking about. Actually, they were asking about the the you know who's on the left and the right of Christ when he's been crucified. First of all, second of all, uh, just as a comment here, which is not a question, but uh, that uh, Art wanted to let you know that um, that uh, he's really enjoying the Research Society and. Um, that uh, the the new info that was uh, added is is great and it's amazing and uh, please keep going with the research society over at jordanmaxwellshow.com. dot com. But again, the question which I misunderstood uh, was uh, the the symbolism involved in who is at the left and right hand side of Christ when he's being crucified. If you don't mind, um, mm-hmm. you know. So sorry about that, Jordan. But you know, it, it's fascinating to put that in perspective as well. The concept that the, uh, the the life of the sun is represented in the Last Supper and that the seasons are represented in the Last Supper and that it is a Passover Seder and that this is exactly what is being depicted there. But again, this is not being done at the time of Christ, even if you believed for a moment that Christ was a literal figure who lived. This is something that da Vinci was commissioned to paint later. That's okay, right. so um, let's just keep that in mind. But meanwhile, again, back to the question is, at the time of crucifixion, there are two individuals uh, which, you know, are notably at the left and right-hand side yeah. of Christ. Mm-hmm. So I if you wouldn't mind... two ta- themes. Mm-hmm. One is fear of the future, and the other is regret for the past. A regret for the past and fear of the future. The two thieves that steal everything from you is the fear of the future and the uh, and the uh, regret for the past. It uh-huh. takes your time and your worth, and it's just taking time away from you. And so it's a thief in your life. The fear of the future and the uh, regret for the past. Hmm. And so the two are on both sides of the sun because the sun brings light into the world. But if you're in the dark, you're always worrying about the regret for the past and the fear of the future. The two thieves that have robbed you of your capability of understanding and of living. Mm. Well, that was that was a much shorter answer than I thought we were going to get for that. Uh, You know, and and there's an interesting thing about thievery, which uh, runs through the text, which runs through the concepts here, Uh, even the legend, right? Uh, the, The gypsy legend, if you will about, uh, you know, the, the reason why gypsies, uh, th- this is one of those weird things, right? The, the gypsy legend of the boy who steals one of the nails, uh, you know, while Christ was being crucified. Um, there's this concept of like just thievery, so to speak, and then yes. the thievery that is, uh, based on the adversarial way that the world is running, really. You know, mm-hmm. why are you concerned about what's in the dark if the same thing is in the light that is in the dark? Well, it's because you've been given to fear that. And like you say, when you're not on the sun, to the left or to the right, either direction you go in, uh, you, you can find if you are not doing things within the light, so to speak, right? Mm-hmm. If you go uh, right. too far right or left of it. Uh, you find yourself in the dark and you find yourself maybe uh, literally restricting yourself even in a psychological, emotional way uh, by right. regrets of the past or fear of the future. These two things will restrict your actions, will take joy from you, will take you away from the light, which is at the center of the imagery. So it makes perfect sense to me, Jordan. Yep, and uh, and also... The, the the Bible is filled, the, the New Testament especially, is filled with astrological symbolism because the basic story about Jesus in the New Testament is referred to by the people who study these subjects of ancient religions, mm-hmm. is referred to as astrotheology. It's an astrological story that's well documented, and it's a fascinating story, and I have talked about it for so long 
and I've said to you before, I think it would be a great idea if we could start a new series mm -hmm. just on the New Testament story of Jesus and show all of the implications of the symbolism about Jesus in the New Testament, what it meant, what happened to him, where he went, what it means in astrology, what these words and terms meant, what, what happened to Jesus, where he went, who, who did what and how they did it, and show how it connects to astrology. I think that would be something that people would be fascinated with. If we could do that, we could start a whole new series just on astral theology. Well, I'd love to begin that the next time we sit down because, to me, this is the key, uh, and, and it is the most relatable thing. Uh, look, even as you're speaking, right, what's coming to my mind when I'm trying to think about this is, you know, the the idea that you should focus on the now, the current, the time of day when the sun is out, right, when things right. are being done. I, th this is such a solid concept which is being related in the scriptures, and it goes across the board. It has a synchronistic uh, you know, a synchronistic truth to it. Again, I'm not somebody who believes in the historical Jesus. I'm not a Christian, anything like that. But there is a universal, and I hate to use that word, but a, a, a really truly, uh, ubiquitous truth to this. If you are in tune with and in the right position as far as, you know, being in the here and now and paying attention to that, not allowing the past or that fear of the unknown, the future, so on and so forth to dictate to you. I mean, isn't this like what everybody tells you will help you to accomplish greater, better, uh, more, uh, uh, you know, in-depth things? Living. Abundant living. There you go. I mean, isn't that a lesson that uh, forget about what it is you want to label yourself? It's a <laughs> valuable lesson. Right? Of course it is. Of course. That's why the Bible's called the greatest story ever told. It's the greatest story ever told. Not the greatest collection of historical facts ever printed. Right. No, the greatest story ever told. It's just a story. It has no basis in actual historical fact. But I don't want to, uh, I, my, my purpose in saying that is not to offend Christians. My mother was a Christian. I went to church with her every Sunday. I loved my mother, and she was a Christian. She went to church, and I went with her. Right. I would never say anything that would, would cast uh, a bad light on my dear mother. But I'm trying to explain to people. I'm not trying to harm anyone or to offend anyone. I'm merely trying to educate people where the ideas have come from. Jesus is referred to as God's son. That's true. There's only one son in our in our area of the galaxy, and it's called the son, S-U-N. And that's why today we call Jesus God's son, because the son doesn't belong to anybody on the earth. It belongs to who? Who does the son belong to? Well, theoretically, if you're religious, we could say the son belongs to God. Well, that means the son that comes up in the morning, that's God's son. Right. And God's son is the light of the world. Well, of course, what else lights the world if it isn't our son, God's son? And he has 12 helpers. He has 12 apostles. That's right, 12 months of the year, the 12 signs of the zodiac. Because life on the earth is a 12-step program. It's like your watch. Look at your watch. It starts with 1 and goes to 12. It's a 12-step program. And, and, and you know, you go to school. That's a 12-step program. You start in the first and, and end up in the 12th grade. Uh, and, and, so and what's the best way to bake your symbol? You know, what's the best way to bake your cookies and to bake your your breads and things like that? Bakers do it in a dozen and they add one, you know, but That's right. The the fact is that they come in dozens, right? We That's we right. we deal in dozens and there's a reason for it because it's very natural. It's just like they say all the time, you know, things come in threes. It's because it's also a natural number. And numerology persists of it is. entirely through through this entire narrative i would be more than happy to go next time we get together we could even just close this out as the primer today and say you know what this is the last one on religion in general 
and we could begin next time to go, and I mean from the ABCs of astral theology all the way through as far as you want to go. I would love to do that with you, actually. Yeah, that would be fun to do because for the first time, people would understand, and I would have, I, you know, I would be at a disadvantage because I'm trying to paint a word picture so that you can see it, right. so that people can say, "Oh, I see what you mean." How do you see it? Because I'm explaining a word picture. I'm trying to explain to you what the story is and how it applies to symbols. Mm. The whole story in the New Testament is a symbolic metaphor. It has no history in it. It's a whole symbolic story. And it has to do with the life of our son, God's son, the light of the world. And 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 God's son is connected to the sun worship of Egypt, the sun gods of Egypt. It's really a, a long and, and interesting story about what we call astrotheology or what the church is teaching today. Hmm. Well, and, and, and the beautiful so, truth, again, the beautiful truth to that is that without that sun, there is no life. You know, here, here we go. Right. I, I mentioned water before, and certainly, uh, uh, Jordan, water is life as well. So, you know, I bet there's a bunch of symbols about water. That are in the scriptures, too, because, again, it's not a historical document, but it has a load of truth in there that is extremely potent. Um, You're ha- right. Has exactly. it been manipulated? It really applies you know? to everything yeah. in your life if you understand the symbolism of what it's telling you. It's obvious. Right. Once you see it. Right. And, and that's and that's really, again, th- this is where, you know, people would say to me, well, you're saying that you don't believe in the Bible. Well, it depends on what you mean. Uh, do, do I believe that it is a historical document that literally lays out A, B and C and this one was begat by this one and so on and so forth? No, I do not. Uh, but it is constructed to relate many truths and uh really explains the entirety of the world around you. <laughs> it certainly does. It's all encoded, but once you see it, you cannot unsee it. Once you see it and it finally dawns on you what is being said, then for the first time, the entire New Testament story of Jesus falls into place and people will then say, oh, I see what this is saying. Right. Oh, I get it now. I didn't see this obvious uh, you know, code. We talk about Bible codes. There's a big one called astrotheology. It's a coded system. And once you understand the Bible code in the New Testament, it's called astrotheology. Theology comes from the word to the in Greek is God. Theo is God in Greek, and so ology is the study of. So if you're going to study about God, it's called theology. And, and, and when you begin to see where the stories in the Old Testament and the New Testament have come from, you will see there's very little, if any, uh, history in the Old Testament. There is none in the New Testament, none at all. There is no history in the New Testament. There is a astral theological encoded symbolic story and it's right in front of you and once you are once you spiritually with your spiritual eyes finally see it then you will say things like oh i see it just Mm -hmm. dawned on me yeah dawn (laughs) yeah the light just finally came into my darkened mind and I've been in the dark all my life, but now I see what you're saying, and it just dawned on me see, that I, what you're seeing in this yeah. New Testament story of Jesus is an encoded, spiritual encoded story about the sun and the life of the sun in, the, <clears throat> in, our, in our solar system. Well, and it, and it tells you the story of you. Well, here, here's the thing that, that, that I think is missed quite often, because... I do a lot of different subjects on my show, right? And religion is not something that I focus on very often, quite honestly. Uh, I've done it a lot with you. <laughs> but, <laughs> but there are very few people that I will sit and, and have this discussion with. 
because it, it just, it usually ends with somebody retreating into whatever it is they have always believed and they, they just, they, they shut themselves off from thinking. And that's the end of it. And I don't want to participate in that. I don't want to sit here and argue and I don't want to go through things where, you know, we, we, we have to discuss because this is my position. This is your position. And that's not what this is to me. What, what is really fascinating is, and, and I don't think I've ever said this anywhere, but I want to see what you think of this idea. And maybe this will make a lot more sense if we do begin a new series on astral theology at this point, because here's what it does. A lot of people will say, well, I'm not even interested in religion. You know, I'd rather hear about politics or news or let me tell you that to understand the way that this works, to understand these symbols one by one and how they fit together into that greatest story ever told, believe it or not, it will begin to let the tumblers fall into place on the many locks that you think are in front of the other symbols that are all around you. The symbols yeah, right. on your money, the symbols in your government. Why is it called this or that? Why are government people also described as ministers? Why are they servants? Clerics. Clerics. Why, yeah, why you are know. clergy called clerics? And it's clerks. Because it's a clerical job. You, you see, there's a reason. And I think that beginning with astral theology, you could begin to decode if you can get your mind wrapped around it in a significant enough way. Not you, Jordan, obviously. But, I mean, if you're listening, if, if you can get your mind wrapped around this and really begin to internalize it and begin to see beyond the code, I think that it would literally unlock all of the rest of it. That's what I think. That's what I've been trying to do for so many years is to just explain simply. I'm not trying to offend anyone. I have the highest of respect for people who care about their spiritual life and want to do what is spiritually right in their life. And so they join a church believing that's a spiritual thing to do. I have the highest uh, admiration and the love for good people who want to do what is right and trying to do the best they can to live by some sort of a spiritual guidance. And so I'm not trying to offend anyone. What I'd like to do as a teacher is I'd like to show you where the ideas have come from. That's right. why we go to school, to learn about electricity and mathematics and geography and science and all the world of knowledge that we need to live by. You go to school so you can learn how to read and think. Mm -hmm. This is what I want to do for the world of theology. And I've said this before in your show. I'd like to reform Christianity according to the old way. The scripture talks about go back to the old way. And we know that we've taken the wrong road somewhere a long time in history. We've taken a wrong road somewhere. And look where we are today. We're in a mess. We're in a very big mess on the world, in the world today as, as humans because we don't know where we've come from. We don't know what we're doing here. We don't know where we've been. And we have no idea in the world where we're going when we leave here. It's okay. because we've been lied to and tricked and deceived, and, and the real truth has been kept from us. And, and I spent my whole life concentrating on the dark side of history, where things have come from, where the words and terms develop what they meant. And boy, when you begin to, for the first time, begin to see what the real story was, it's going to cause you to have to think a little bit because it is an encoded system of symbols. But once you get it, it becomes very obvious. Once you find out what the basic symbol of the Bible story of Jesus is, everything makes sense. It all falls into place. And then you will see it has zero, nothing to do with, with Christianity today, nothing right. whatsoever. There is no connection between the actual story and the New Testament of Jesus and the religion we call Christianity today. 
has no connection whatsoever. All right. And, and so, the thing to keep in mind here, though, Jordan, is you, you brought up the the concept of being a teacher. You brought up the concept of what it is that you're uh, uh, supposed to be learning in your schools anyway. What do you have to learn? Well, you have to learn to read. Well, how do you learn to read? You have to learn a language. And then we show you how the symbols of that language are expressed. Um, and I think that this is exactly what would be done with the, a, a series on astral theology. Uh, but also, guess what? You also have to learn your math, don't you? And when you go to learn your math, uh, there are different uh, systems by which numbers are utilized. And that would explain, you know, literally... <laughs> <laughs> Here is your reading, writing, and arithmetic, if you will, you know, from the old song, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that that they were supposed to teach you as part of the basics when you got into your what they call a primary school. Um, mm -hmm. I think that this would be, uh, I know a lot of it, you know will be so automatic for you, it, it'll probably be like, well, gee, you know, here I am talking about the weather. Uh, that's how exciting it'll be. But I think it would be a, a, a great series to begin. And I say we definitely begin that the very next time we get together um, and, uh, and, and just do it because this would be a way to put it together in a series that would uh, that would allow somebody to go. Okay, here's your ABCs. Here's your one, two, threes. Here's how, it's, here's how it started. Here's what it means. And here, you know, here's what it all means. Right, and, and obviously, I, and I said to you yeah. before on your show, I said that if you have a two-story building, if you own a two-story building, and you're going to put a lot of weight on the second floor, like uh, like uh, printing presses or storing automobiles and trucks on the second floor, the smart thing to do is to go downstairs, remove the ceiling tiles, and get a, uh, a building inspector to go up uh, on a ladder and look at the foundation of that floor you're going to build on. Before you go putting that weight on that floor, mm -hmm. look at the foundation of the, of the floor from downstairs. And now you can see if it's going to hold that kind of weight. Well, the idea being is that you are standing under the foundation you're going to build on. Mm -hmm. And that's where we get the word understanding. If you don't stand under what you think you understand, you don't understand. You're just standing on the floor, but you have no idea what you're standing on. And I've given you another example. Mm -hmm. If you're going to if you're going to mail a box across the country, a box to a friend, you're going to mail something to someone. You go in the garage and you get some thin rope and you will tie up the box and take it to the post office and mail it. And that that rope will probably suffice if it's just a rope you're tying up your box. But if you're going to take that same rope and go off uh, up on the top of a 10-story building and tie it to something on the top of the building and going to hang your life on it, you're going to hang off the side of the building uh, 10 stories up on that rope, well, now you better go back and check the integrity of that rope you're hanging your life on. Mm. You better understand the value of that rope and if it can hold your weight you better understand you better check the uh, integrity of that rope you're, you're hanging your life on right. so I'm saying you're hanging your life on an idea and a belief system called Jesus and the New Testament but you don't understand the symbols and the words and the terms and the church has misled you from the beginning because you don't even know what the word church means. You don't know where it's come from. People tell you what they think the word church means. But when you find out what it actually means, you'd be ashamed of yourself to go to a church when you understand where the word church comes from. That's what I'm trying to tell you. You need to realize that the old, that the New Testament of Jesus is not history. It's a story. It's called the greatest story ever told. It's a symbolic metaphor story. Right. And it, once you see the, the, each one of the symbols and what they mean and understand where Jesus comes into the picture, who he is and what he represents in the story, then all of a sudden it all begins to make sense. And for the first time you begin to see, and then you will say to me things like, oh, I see, 
It just dawned on me what you're talking about. Now I see it. And all of a sudden, I'm telling you to know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Once you see the entire subject of the New Testament of Jesus is a symbolic metaphor story of astrology, the correct understanding of astrology, and go back to the very beginning into the ancient world and see what the people were trying to tell you, now for the first time it will finally dawn on you. The sun will finally come up in your brain, in your mind, and you will be enlightened. And now you will begin to see the real story of Christianity and what it is actually telling you about the life you live, and it will blow your mind. It will be so phenomenal when you hear what you have actually thought was one thing was actually an encoded, symbolic story telling you something totally different than what you have ever heard. And it's all right there, and there's no way you're going to counter argument. You cannot counter the argument because it's too overwhelmingly obvious. Hmm. So, well, again, this is this is uh, uh, so fascinating because, look, like you said, with the old ways, right? There were things that pre-existed what we call the, you know, the Bible, the text itself, right? And. Hmm. Many of these things told you the same story, <laughs> you of know. Of course, it did. And, and it's it, you know, and, and some people say, "Oh, well, what you're saying is that the writers of the Bible were plagiarists." I, I don't necessarily go with I'm that not idea. Saying that, no, I'm not saying that they weren't plagiarists. What, what it is, though, is that Dan Brown is a plagiarist. Well, right. <laughs> In my book, Dan Brown is a plagiarist. That's I don't think true. Dan Brown knows anything about. Uh, the stories he wrote. I don't even think he wrote it. I don't think he's got enough brains to write it. But, but I think it, yeah. I think the story Dan Brown wrote about uh, about the uh, Holy Blood, Holy Grail was actually written by three British, brilliant British authors many years ago, back in 1980. Three guys in England who were producers for the BBC. Mm -hmm. They had a show like 60 Minutes. On the BBC, and they wrote, and they each week or every two weeks or whatever it was, they would come out with one subject and do a whole hour and a half to two hour show on one subject, investigating the subject. And they did a show called Holy Blood, Holy Grail. And it talked about the secret societies of Freemasonry in Europe who have manipulated the, the thinking of the whole world and given us Christianity, given us the idea of Jesus and where it all came from. Mm -hmm. And so the, I believe that the Illuminati masters of the Masonic order in Europe want the people to be again uh, misled and, and deceived. And so they, the Illuminati masters of Freemasonry in Europe, have come up with the story, which is referred to as the British Israel World Federation. That's a whole new subject. Mm. And they, and they, and they write that story and they say, now go out and preach this story, Airhead, and we'll make you a star. We'll make you, we'll give you a lot of money and you'll become very important and we'll put your name on the book. Right. It's just like the, what they did with, uh, with, uh, Karl Marx, the, the people, the Masonic Order in England, they wrote a book called, uh, Das Kapital and they put, the, then they wrote another book called uh, the the Communist Manifesto. Right. The Communist Manifesto was not written by Karl Marx. He had nothing to do with it. It was written by a group of writers and a group of men in in London, in the in the city of London, that one mile square of international bankers. They wrote a book called the Communist Manifesto, and they picked some poor, dumb, unemployed goofball named uh, Karl Marx and and put his name on it. And you know, Karl Marx didn't write anything. He didn't write anything about the Communist Manifesto. And that group was called the League of Just Men. Mm. Look it up on dictionary, the League of Just Men. Mm. So it's a very interesting story about how we've been lied to on every front and misled. But the story in the Bible is not a lie. It's not a uh, plagiarized. It's just a retelling of the most ancient story in the world. The most ancient story in the world 
will take you back to the original ancient stuff that the Egyptians knew that we have no idea about, the Babylonians, Sumerians, the Phoenician Canaanites, the uh, the people from India, the Hindus. There was a phenomenally brilliant story developed out of the ancient world that has come down to us today, and we call it Christianity. No, it's the greatest story ever told. It's a symbolic metaphor. Well, see, here, here's see yeah, no, absolutely, and here's how I explain this. Uh, the, the, this problem of, well, it was written before it was written. Uh, it, it, look at it this way. Jordan, and I'm going to use you and I as examples if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. Jordan is the age that he could easily be my father generationally. So if I were to imagine that Jordan at the age of 20 went to go see the Grand Canyon and wrote a description of the Grand Canyon, um, and then... I, at the age of 20, which would have been closer to Jordan's, say, 40 or 45, <laughs> would mm -hmm. have gone and somewhere in there. I mean, I'm 47, so, you know, give or take a few years. Uh, if I go to the Grand Canyon at the age of 20 and I write a description of the Grand Canyon, I have not plagiarized Jordan's work. I have given you my version of it sometime mm -hmm. later. And and I might have read Jordan's description and decided that I would write my own description, but that's not me plagiarizing him. That's not me getting the idea from him necessarily. That's just me saying, well, this is what I observe, and this is my way of telling that story. Now, the of language will look different. Of course. You know, and all of that, and it would be 20 years later. So, I mean, look, I might have actually, you know, Jordan might have typed it on an older typewriter 20 years earlier when I wasn't quite here yet. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, and you were typing it on a new computer. I might I type it on yeah. one, one of those old clunky computers now that people, you know, think of as dinosaur like. But truth is, maybe we're typing it on different instruments. Maybe we're relating it with different words. Maybe we don't even speak the same language, but we're merely describing something at a different time that is still there. And the Grand Canyon wouldn't have changed all that much in 20 years. No. So. I know. That's the way I look at it. So when the, you know, when, when the Babylonians were explaining this, when the, uh, the Sumerians were explaining this, they mm -hmm. did it their way. And then later on, it was done another way. And the Egyptians did it another way. And the Christians have now done it another way, you know, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Um, but it doesn't mean that it's plagiarism necessarily. It simply means that it is something that is being observed by different people at a different time in a different language, period. So and they're trying to explain it their way. Right. So and that's Especially yeah. today with Christianity, we have been taught by other people what it all means. It's called the church. The church has taught us what, what Christianity is all about. In actual point of fact, the church is wrong. That's not what Christianity is all about. If you go back and, and bother to do the homework, and I've done it for 60 years. Right. I was talking about this back in 1959. That's exactly 59 years ago. Well, next year, it would be 60 years. I've been trying to tell the people without offending anyone or without hurting the feelings of anyone that if you're going to care and concern yourself with the spiritual outcome of your life and you want to do what is right with yourself and the great spirit who created us, then at least get it right. right. At least before you leave this world, understand the greatest story ever told. The greatest story ever told, we call it today, the story of Jesus. No, there was no Jesus, but it is the greatest story ever told, right. not the greatest collection of facts. And once you see, once I start to lay out from step one, the first, the first story about Jesus and begin to lay it out for you, it's not going to take very long for it to finally dawn on you what I'm talking about. And then you will be able to go back in now 
and read the New Testament story of Jesus, and it all makes sense. Now it all falls into place. Exactly. So the next time we get together, since we are beginning to run out of time, the next time we get together, it won't be in the name of this series. Uh, <laughs> we're going to begin with the very basics, and I do mean the ABCs. Jordan, I mean, yeah. I literally envision asking you, okay, Jordan, uh, let's imagine, because we're going to have to imagine, that I have no idea what you mean by astral theology. Can you explain it? Uh, tell me what it is that you mean by the term, and then begin to line these things up from the very basics. And yeah. I think uh, this will be useful even for somebody who thinks that they are well-studied regarding mm -hmm. astral theology, because, you know, I always find it fascinating to go back, no matter what area that I think I have a, a decent base of knowledge on. If I go back and look at the very earliest pieces of that, sometimes I am refreshed as to uh, certain things that, that I think I know rather well. And I say, you know, I did forget that there was this aspect of it because it's not used very often or not mentioned very often or whatever. I often have to go back to the very basics in order to keep myself centered and That's to keep right. myself learning and moving forward in the more advanced stages. So the next time we get together, we'll do Astral Theology Part 1. But as we come to an end here tonight, I want to remind everybody that if you go over to jordanmaxwellshow.com and you go into the Research Society, uh, there is an entire section on religion which you can expand uh, upon anything that's been discussed on this show or in this series. You can uh, uh, go deeper into many other topics, including the monetary system, the government, uh, you know, the, the, the birth certificate itself, a certain lectures which have been given by other people in the past related to all these subjects, articles that were written, various images, all collected uh, in, in the research society that is the Jordan Maxwell Research Society. And you join that for a one-time fee and you can actually get in there and start doing some homework. It's not a complete website yet. There are many terabytes of information that are going to be added to it. It's a deep dive already, but I assure you it's going to get deeper. Uh, but if you go over to jordanmaxwellshow.com, there's also a public area. There's a couple of videos you can stream for very cheap, and uh, you, you could make a contribution, make a contact with Jordan, because there's also a contact form at jordanmaxwellshow.com. But here's the key. It's the only website that is actually Jordan Maxwell's. Other people try to use his name. Other people are making money, which Jordan is not making off of his name. <laughs> but anyway... Uh, if you appreciate what Jordan has done, you could make a contribution over there. You could join the research society. You could, oh, buy one of those streaming videos or, hey, if you're not able to do any of that, you could just send him a note and tell him that you appreciate what he's done. Ask him a question. Um, give him some feedback about these shows. He appreciates that as well. But, you know, obviously, because, again, telling the truth does not pay well, a contribution would be much appreciated at jordanmaxwellshow.com, which is the only website that is actually Jordan Maxwell's. So, Jordan, i give you the last couple of minutes here. If you want to uh, close out the discussion in any way, shape, or form, up to you, my friend. Uh, we are going to begin anew. Next time we get together, uh, hopefully it'll be next week. But if not, it'll be one of these upcoming Mondays where we're going to begin the ABCs, really, of astral theology. Uh, I I'm, might just call it that, the series on astral theology. <laughs> um, yeah, but I would like to get all of this actually recorded so that before I leave this world, I'm 80 years, I'm almost 80 years old, and this is on the back of my mind continually. I have so much I would like for people to know that I've spent my life trying to find, and I now see what uh, how much has been mis how many times the people have been misled to believe things they don't understand, and I would like to be able to get this out and recorded so that when I do leave this world, at least I left with information that people will be able to use in the coming the coming years and the coming world that's coming people will be able to at least understand what christianity was really all about mm -hmm. and where it came from and then you'll begin to see how it's outworking itself 
on the world you live in today, how the things that you will learn about astrotheology will explain to you for the first time what you're seeing in government, religion, and politics, entertainment, and movies. It will begin all to make sense for the first time. And then to know the truth, and the truth will set you free. No more worrying yourself about whether you're going to die and go to hell. No more worrying yourself about what's going to happen to you and where you're going when you leave this world and the boogeyman's going to get you. Uh, all of that. No, once you see where all of this religious stuff has come from, where it's all developed, what the words meant, the, uh, the etymology of not only the words but the ideas, once you see it, you cannot unsee it. You will always carry it with you, and you'll be able to say, now I see what's really going on, how the world actually works. And I say that that's the thing that you need to do right now because the world is in a very dark place spiritually and politically, and we need to wake up and find out what the words mean and what's really going on in this country. Because when you find out what the political situation in America actually, in fact, is and what it all means, you're not going to believe it. It's going to be so startling to you when you find out what has actually been going on in this country since since before the turning of 1900. It's been going on in America and you didn't know it. No one told you what was going on, why America was founded what the words meant and what the symbols meant and why you have all the trouble and the co confusion and the chaos today is because you don't know what happened years ago. And I can help you to, for the first time, go on my website to Jordan Maxwell Show, join my research society, and, I, and I'm almost 80 years old. I don't know anything about technology, so I have a very, very good uh, uh uh, webman, but there's only so much he can do in any eight hour day, and he's got his own life to live, but he's helping me. And so go on my website to Jordan Maxwell Show, join the Jordan Maxwell Research, and you will begin to see for the first time what I'm talking about when you go on my research society. You will see pictures and documents and all kinds of interesting articles about the world you live in that you've never been told before. And I want to thank you again, Chuck, for giving me the opportunity to talk to the people. Well, I thank you for, for being the teacher that you are and, uh, for, for really providing people with it, with the chance, <laughs> the chance, the opportunity, if you will, to, uh, to begin to decode what is around them. Because ah, whether you want to believe in it or not, and I don't mean you, Jordan, I do mean the listener, whether you want to believe in, the symbols or you want to believe in the order which has been, you know, apparently erected all around you. Uh, it, it is irrelevant. It is there. And the symbols and the, well, the relativity of what it is that you're discussing prevail as the, well, the driving force behind so much that people do not understand. Uh, and again, it's because they didn't check the foundation. <laughs> like you were explaining. And, uh, well, we're going to do that when we go forward with the Astral Theology series. I'm going to consult with you about how it is we're going to begin there, but I think we have an outline already. I want to thank everybody who uh, paid attention <laughs> and decided to listen to this series. I know there's a lot of you who have gone from Episode 1 all the way to now, and... um I do appreciate what you guys have done. I hope that you will also join us for the Astral Theology series. I believe it is the logical next step, as you do, Jordan. And uh, again, I, I really appreciate all that you have done. Uh, it has certainly had a, a grand influence on me, and uh, I am more than pleased to participate in this with you.